There it comes, there it comes. Here we go. Gearing you up for it. Woo! Still going to get some ring? Good. Good morning. Certainly good to see everybody today. It's a beautiful day. Uh, it's, it's the wintry weather mix upon us, right? Uh, it's a good change for here in Chico, and we praise God for all that He does for us, changing His seasons and all the blessings that He bestows on us. We want to um, uh, thank Him for that always. I also want to welcome our guests. Uh, if you're visiting with, with us today, thank you for being here. We appreciate your presence. If you have a moment to fill out an attendance card we have on the back table uh, at the exit back there, uh, we'd love to send you some more info about what goes on here at the church. There's all kinds of stuff always going on here at this church. Um, you know, we embarked on at the first of the year um, a uh, Bible reading for the whole congregation. We started uh, a little late, though. We started on January 18th. <laughs> and uh, what, what that's going to do is it's going to bring us over into the new year. So I just want to take a moment and let you know that uh, we're going to leave those extra three weeks up to you guys. We're going we're gonna to start over January 1st, but uh, we're going to give you the freedom to do what you want to do with reading your Bible. How's that sound? So oppressive in here, isn't it? Uh, if you Actually, if you have been keeping up with your daily Bible readings, um, we've been moving through the book of Ezekiel uh, over the past few weeks, and that is a tough read, is it not? Uh, you know, it, it, it's one of those books that carries a particularly dark overtone to it, the first half of it anyway, and it's very graphic in nature. You know, I, I'm pretty sure that if you've been reading it, you're probably thinking, is this really in my Bible? <laughs> it's just one of those things. So what I'm trying to do is appeal to you to go back and read a little bit um, if you haven't been. It's a fascinating uh, exploration of God and His, his relationship to His people, um, particularly the Israelites. And what we're going to be looking at today is Ezekiel chapter 37. So if you have your Bibles, I invite you to turn there. We're going to read a little bit about God's relationship to His people. And we're going to uh, you know, be reminded that at this point in the narrative and God's overall story about Him and His people, uh, God's people have offended Him. Yeah. They have been... Um, disloyal to God. And now we read about in Ezekiel, it's God's turn to offend. He can only offend God so long before He Himself starts to offend people. And this is one of the most destructive images in Ezekiel chapter 37 that is, we probably find in all of Scripture, the whole spectrum of Scripture. Um, it's this picture of death and destruction. It's completely desolate often uh, referred to as the Valley of Dry Bones, if you're familiar with the story. This is in Ezekiel 37. But it's interesting, as grim and as uh, depressing as the scene, uh, the imagery is in Ezekiel 37, um, we continue to read this story and we're introduced to not only a God that will himself offend those who offend him, but a God who will restore those who have been offended by him. That's what we're going to read about today, um, learning how to follow a God that will restore, that will give us power, that will give us strength and confidence, even when we have failed Him greatly. And oftentimes we do fail Him greatly, do we not? As people, we have a hard time moving through this life. We oftentimes stumble and trip and fall intellectually, emotionally, spiritually, of course, but God, we're going to read about as a God of hope. He wants to invite His people back in. He wants to teach us that when we follow Him, we can expect certain things. We can expect to experience certain things. And following God, this is our point today, obviously, following God leads us to experience His power, His truth, and His restoration. All those things we will experience when we follow God intently. Following God leads us to experiencing His power, truth, and restoration. Say it with me one time. Following God leads us to experiencing His power, truth, and restoration. And before we're going to get here, we're going to explore this, this story. The Valley of the Dry Bones. I'd like to read that to you at this time. 
Ezekiel chapter 37, verses 1 through 10. The hand of the Lord was on me, and He brought me out by the Spirit of the Lord and set me in the middle of a valley. It was full of bones. He led me back and forth among them, and I saw a great many bones on the floor of the valley, bones that were very dry. He asked me, human, can these bones live? I said, sovereign Lord, you alone know. Then he said to me, prophesy to these bones and say to them, dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. This is what the sovereign Lord says to these bones. I will make breath enter you and you will come to life. I will attach tendons to you and make flesh come upon you and cover you with skin. I will put breath in you and you will come to life. Then you will know that I am the Lord. So I prophesied. Ezekiel says, as I was commanded. And I, as I was prophesying, there was, mm-hmm. there was a great rattle. I could try to memorize it. Uh, yes, a noise. Getting off to a great start here, huh? This imagery here, this is, this is fascinating. There was a great noise, a rattling sound as Ezekiel's prophesying. And the bones came together, bone to bone. I looked and tendons and flesh appeared on them and skin covered them, but there was no breath in them. Then he said to me, prophesy to the breath. Prophesy, human, and say to it, this is what the sovereign Lord said, come, breath, from all four corners and breathe into these slain that they may live. So I prophesied as he commanded me and and breath entered them. They came to life and stood up on their feet, a vast army. You know, chapter 37, this portion of the Scripture, if, if it's not blatantly just it, the imagery here is so visual. If you're not getting uh, an image in your mind of these things happening, you know, I, I dare you to go back and read it again and read it intently. Because this is one of the more uh, awesome dis- depictions in, in our Scripture about God's power. And what we're seeing here, uh, Ezekiel is prophesying about future events. This is obviously a prophetic text. Ezekiel himself was a prophet, prophesying to the nation of Israel. And through Ezekiel's actions, actions here, through Ezekiel's actions here, rather, we learn more about the process of following God. He's doing what God tells him to do in the, um, in the midst of such desolation. He's doing what God tells him to do in the midst of death and destruction. Very horrid scene. And the audience, as we read Ezekiel and we read about Ezekiel's actions, the audience becomes more acquainted with the implications of doing what God says to do. If you notice, Ezekiel did everything that God said to do. We'll look more closely at that here in a moment. But when we look at Ezekiel and his actions, we'll find that following God leads us to experiencing his power first. God is a great God, a powerful God, a sovereign God that we believe can do anything at all times. Ezekiel believed that too. And it's, um, I think it's important for us to take note about Ezekiel's context just for a moment. Uh, Ezekiel lived a long, long time ago. He lived in the 7th, 6th century B.C. And you know we've been looking a little bit at the prophets over the past few months and been exploring them and preaching from those texts. And we, we know a lot about what was going on with Israel. You remember the nation divided, split into two halves, the northern and the southern kingdom. The northern kingdom was conquered first, and now the southern kingdom we read about in Ezekiel's time is being conquered and captured. Matter of fact, Ezekiel is one of those people who was captured by Babylon and and, and sent to Babylon. He spent time there. He was there actually when he was prophesying among all these people. Um, And we read more about Ezekiel's time in captivity as the book goes on, but he's talking to these people who are sharing captivity with himself. And there's a judgment that he's proclaiming to these people. He said, see, we're in this mess because you weren't faithful to God. God wants you to be faithful to Him, but you keep being rebellious. You keep doing the things that He doesn't want you to do. You're just not listening to God. Matter of fact, Ezekiel chapter 1 all the way through chapter 33, the middle of it is essentially that kind of doom and gloom thing. It's just saying, hey, you're doing wrong, you're doing wrong, you're rebellious, and this is why this happened. But as the book turns, 
Ezekiel's one of these prophets, not un, he's much unlike Amos, rather, where his, his story is not just doom and gloom. There is a message of hope here. Amen? We serve a God who gives us hope. He allows us to be visionaries, to escape the bondage that we put ourselves in and reimagine a whole new existence in life for ourselves. Ooh. I need that. I know you do too sometimes. Probably all the time. This is what Ezekiel's talking about. He says, you got yourself into a big mess here, but God's given us an opportunity. He will give us an opportunity to get out of this, and He's going to restore us and help us. In chapter 37, we're reading this story about the dry bones. We see this uh, kind of both things happening here. Uh, Ezekiel pronouncing judgment on these people, but he's offering hope as well. There's two things happening here at this time. And there's, reading this story is graphic imagery, imagery that reveals, uh, reveals rather a, a story of a defeated people. You know, Ezekiel is talking to these, these people, he's preaching to these people who really had lost a lot of hope. You know, they were beaten down, broken down, they'd experienced some pretty tough stuff. You know, we read about the whole narrative of God's people in the Old Testament. And boy, when they went into captivity, they went into captivity. They were hurting I guess everybody, anybody's felt like that before, huh? Life is bleak. It's not a lot of hope in tomorrow. This message is for you. Because life doesn't have to be bleak. And there is a lot of hope in tomorrow. Ezekiel's going to tell us. We don't have to be a defeated people. We don't have to experience that oppression. God's called us for something more. And quite frankly, Ezekiel's spelling this out for these people. He tells us in verse 11 here, then he said to me, God said to me, human, these bones are the people of Israel. They say our bones are dried up and our hope is gone. We are cut off. See, right here, Ezekiel's just encapsulating this idea of God's people were hurting. They were having a hard time, stuck, no hope. But we must remember, Ezekiel reminds us, that it is God who put them there in this exile. It's because of their actions that they're in the mess they're in. Now, self-disclosure is a funny thing, and I'm hesitant to uh, stand up here oftentimes and tell certain aspects of my, my existence, my life. <laughs> uh, but, you know, I, I found this interesting. I, I'm one of these guys, these preachers, who sees a, a sermon illustration in everything. You know what I mean? My, my wife has to temper my behavior oftentimes. It, don't, Jack, quit it. Seeing that sermon illustration and a cup of water being spilled, you know. Uh, but now, this is interesting. You know, over the past week, I don't know if you talked to me last week, but I had what appeared to be a small marble in the side of my mouth or a plug of chewing tobacco, Levi Garrett. Yeah. <laughs> my face was swelling up last Sunday, uh, and my, my whole head the last uh, two weeks ago started really, really hurting. Oh, man, it hurt. Anyway, um, I come to find out that I had a, a crown popped off about over a month ago. And it didn't bother me <laughs> at the time. <laughs> but what happened was um, it, got, it got pretty nasty. And an infection uh, set in in my mouth. And it just started swelling up, swelling up, swelling up. And, you know, by Sunday night, my wife can attest, I was, ah! Maybe not so much, but, or maybe I was, I don't know. You know and I understand that in, 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 the, in the terms of pain, it's relative, right? I mean, I know many of you experienced an enormous amount of pain in your life. And I'm not addressing the pain aspect necessarily here. But what I am addressing is this. You know, I went to the dentist, I sat in a chair, bright and early, 7 o'clock, Monday morning when he opened, I was there waiting to get in. He said, oh, yeah, you know, he looked at it, and the crown came off, yeah, yeah. Um, wh what happened here? And I asked him, and he said, well, this is, this is what happens sometimes. You, you put a crown on a tooth, and they put adhesive on it to, to keep it from falling off, of course, glue it. Uh, and over time, the adhesive kind of started loosening up, and bacteria got in. And as bacteria got in over, this is over years, it rotted the tooth, decayed, came in, and just destroyed the tooth from the inside. 
I was like, sermon illustration. <laughs> Watch out. This is what happened to God's people. They started with a little bit. Just a little bit crept in. A little bit got under the glue, the coverage. They let a little bit in. It creeped in, it creeped in, it creeped in until it finally just decayed the whole bunch of them. <laughs> no. It's a whole other sermon illustration. We can get into it. <laughs> but so the beautiful thing about this is, even though these things happen, and these, the, these things, these infidelities cause their exile, the Israelites, uh, Ezekiel's going to remind them that God has the power to reconstruct, too. He has the power to build back. He has the power to make things better. And that's the kind of God we serve. Ezekiel, who's following God at this time, follows the Spirit, we see. It's just interesting, the same thing Jesus does in Matthew chapter 4. Ezekiel follows the Spirit into this land of desolation. And he's witnessing during this uh, virtual resurrection, if you will, God's ability to give life in a valley of nothingness, of complete death, where there were nothing but bones there. God has the power to reconstruct that scene and make it into a vibrant, living community. That's what God does. Ezekiel understands, as he's following God, that the one who follows God will experience every dimension of God's life-giving power. The externals are great, that's one thing. But as we know, the externals fall apart, don't they, in this lifetime? God has the ability to reconstruct, though. That's what he's showing Ezekiel. It's interesting, the psalmist, too, when we read Psalms 23, one of the most famous psalms in our Old Testament, and in the Psalter itself, we read of um, the author discussing or bringing up this imagery of a valley, of a valley of, of death, if you will. He says this, The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. He refreshes my soul. He guides me along the right paths for His name's sake. But this is the part I want to draw our attention to. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. See, Ezekiel and the psalmist, they're kind of on the same page here, walking through this valley of death which actually, metaphorically, we all walk through if we just open our eyes from time to time. We're all in the midst of complete danger and breaking down and of the life we live. But Ezekiel here learns that when you follow God, he has the power to reconstruct that which we experience. He gives life to dead bones. He also gives courage to those experiencing that desolation. He infuses that energy to have confidence. Encourage not being the absence of fear, but the willingness to proceed in spite of what we encounter. And confidence is really the faith or certainty in God's ability to do what He does. Moreover, He gives us comfort on this journey. Have you ever thought about power in terms of comfort? Oftentimes when we employ the worldview that God's in control and He's taking care of things, that's very powerful in and of itself, is it not? Power. But that's not all we get when we follow God. We, we, we just don't get to experience His power in the multidimensional planes of His power. Ezekiel's story here in chapter 37 reminds us much more of that. We experience His power and His truth. Amen. Joyce, I love you being on the front row every Sunday. Love it. Thank you. This is powerful stuff. Because we live in a world that deals in falsities and falsehoods. Some things, many things that are going on around us are simply illusions. They are not real. But yet we treat them as real. Our emotions run real. Our distractions are real. Ezekiel's experience following God leads him to understand the truth in what's going on around him. He says this in verses 12 and 13. Therefore, prophesy, God says, and say to them, 
This is what the Sovereign Lord says, My people, I am going to open your graves and bring you up from them. I will bring you back to the land of Israel. Then you, my people, will know that I am the Lord when I open your graves and bring you up from them. Right here, God is telling Ezekiel to just speak truth. This is what I'm going to do, God says, and this is the truth. Wait for it. It's going to be true. Buckle up, because it's going to be true. God has the power and ability to define truth, something for all of us to experience and give back to Him. Living our lives honestly and openly, saying, here I am, God. I want to give you glory. Isaiah and Ezekiel, both, all these prophets live their lives like that. They follow where God's leading. Ezekiel's no different. He enters into this verbal dimension of God's truth in this narrative where God tells Isaiah what to say, and when Isaiah says it, the stuff starts happening right before his eyes. When God speaks it, it happens. That's something for us to take note of. God has the power to establish truth, in other words. In chapter 37, verse 9, which says this, prophesy to the breath, Prophesy, son of man, and say to it, this is what the sovereign Lord says. Come, breath, from the four winds and breathe into these slain that may live. God himself is commanding things that we don't even see. Things that we don't even think about. And it reminds reminds all of us of God's ability to control the things unseen. The mechanics behind the scenes, if you will. God has the ability to command life to happen. And we think about this breath of life, you know, I was reading this text, and it always reminds me of Genesis chapter 2, verse 7, where if you remember the, the creation story, this is the second creation story, in fact, we read in Genesis, but he creates Adam, and it almost appears from, from dust and dirt, and Adam's just kind of laying there <laughs> until he breathes life into his nostrils, the breath of God. Ezekiel sees this truth. He witnesses this truth. Oftentimes, when we follow God, we can see Him working. We can see the things that we normally don't see happen. But we have to go where He's going. We have to be led where He's leading. Just as God raises His army in Ezekiel, we see this this, this image come to life for us as we read God establishes a reality of hope for His people. Not only is God powerful enough to do this, not only does He say it's going to happen and it happened, God's got a mission for it. He's got a plan for it. It should inspire an enormous amount of hope for all of us, especially His people we read about. Through Ezekiel, we find God promising to raise people up, introducing this truth of resurrection. So it doesn't matter how many times you've been beat down, God will raise you up. That's what He does. And moreover, (laughs) this life in the end won't beat us down at all because we have victory in what God's done through Jesus. We can live eternally and experience God's power, God's truth, and We'll see a little bit more of what we can experience here according to Isaiah. There's a purpose. God's just going to resurrect us to restore us. That's what he says ultimately. I will put my spirit in you and you will live and I will settle you in your own land Then you will know that I and the Lord have spoken and I have done it, declares the Lord, signed, sealed, delivered, amen. Restoration. That's what we see here. God has the power to restore. He's going to raise you up. He's not going to raise you up just to get kicked around again and beat around in the same old patterns that you used to get beat around up in. That even makes sense. God has something prepared for you. He has prepared something great and grand for us, and He wants to give us a whole lot of it. And there's these four dimensions of God giving here that we see. In Ezekiel. For one, God's intentional about restoring. God chooses to act on our behalf. 
It's not anything that we've done. It's not like you have to follow these rules and be um, just completely uh, picturesque, picture-perfect, kind of cookie-cutter, cut-out uh, of rules and regulations. It's not about that. It's about living our lives and giving glory to a gracious God, wanting to adjust our patterns of behavior and our intellect in order to serve Him and see what He has in store for us. But God's the one who's doing that, Ezekiel reminds us. Also, we see this dimension of life, both presently and eternally, that God restores for us. Our present conditions, He will refresh, like our First Peter chapter 5, verse said a moment ago, He will restore us in times of need. When we have difficulties or even good times in this life, God will help replenish our sense of stability and identity, and He's got something prepared for us in the long run. There's an eternal dimension to God's restoration. And I think one of the most important dimensions of this is destination. One of the last uh, knowledges, too, I'll just go ahead and throw it up here. I think these two are critical for understanding God's restorative purposes. God has something in store for you. He created you to end up somewhere. That's fascinating if you think about that. He's got something in line for you. So what I'm saying is, you don't get distracted by what happens today. We put our faith in God to know He's got something in store for us tomorrow. Amen? And then knowing that kind of completes this idea of restoration. Knowing that God is the one who graciously and mercifully restores us and resurrects us and gives us truth to work within, the framework of truth, and gives us the power to recognize that. Ezekiel's prophecy here, as we're closing up, reminds us uh, that God does desire a relationship with His people. Oftentimes we find ourselves in exile or find ourselves in this intellectual limbo where we just don't quite understand what's going on in our lives or the lives of a loved one. But God here reminds us that He cares about His people, all of His people, and He's willing to go the extra mile to restore that relationship with His people. And we see that embodied in the notion and message of Jesus Christ. God gave us His only Son to show us that He's willing to go there. He's willing to give us that home, that security, moreover, that power, that truth, that restoration that only He can provide. It's through Jesus that we recognize that. So in other words, I guess what I'm trying to say is this, when we follow Jesus, we follow God, and we experience what God has to offer through Jesus. Amen? I don't know how to close the sermon much better than that. I think that's good. I hope it is. This week, let us go where God leads. Let Him open up the doors for us so we can see His workings, not ours. So we can see His truth, not ours because it's oftentimes distorted. And let Him be the one to restore us, not us. God has promised to do that for His people, and He's going to do that for His people. If you need help getting that power, getting that truth, getting that restoration, I'm going to offer you an opportunity to come down here. We can pray with you, and let you be restored into the Lord like that. And if you haven't been baptized today to experience that full restorative uh, glory of God, we're going to give you an opportunity to be baptized Right now, would you come forward as we stand and sing? Someday you'll stand at the bar on high. Someday you'll record you.